and it probably never crosses your mind about the, the time they went missing and you got them back. Although I think of it even to this day. In 1988, the Detroit Pistons had finally vanquished the Boston Celtics. But to win the franchise's first championship, they would have to beat Michigan's favorite son, Magic Johnson, and the defending champion, Los Angeles Lakers. I thought that uh, we were a very confident basketball team. Uh, I think all the guys felt that they could win the series and uh, pretty pumped up. Game one at Los Angeles, the Pistons stunned the Lakers at the Forum, 105-93. Adrian Dantley unstoppable with 34 points. <laughs> if I can recall, I think that almost every shot I took, I made, I think it was 14 for 16 from the floor, and uh, we ended up winning that, uh, that, that first game. That was, that was pretty exciting. Everybody says you're the one who's burning inside who wants that ring. Yeah, I want it. Everybody wanted it. It was my 12th year. It was an uh, exciting time. For the team, I know for myself, being in the final for the first time. So, uh, but the Lakers won Game Two with a flu-ridden Magic Johnson scoring 23 points, and then they took the first one at Detroit, and again, Urban Johnson was magic with 18 points and 14 assists. Game Four, the tough got going on both sides. Every time we hit the floors, it's basically we're going for a championship, and uh, it's take name and numbers time now. Best buddies Isaiah and Magic kissed at the start. By the end, they were at war as the Pistons even the series at 2-2. He made the statement before it started, if I was coming through the lane, he would slam me. And I came through the lane and he slammed me. <laughs> it was a good series. Adrian Dantley, in his second season with the Pistons, led the team in scoring three of those first four games, and the series stood tied at two. Not only was game five critical to determining the series, it was to be the last Pistons game at the old Pontiac Silverdome, and it drew the most fans in NBA Finals history, an attendance record that still stands. Timeout Detroit. This crowd sensing an explosion here with 312 remaining. AD again led the way with 25 points, lifting the Pistons to a 3-2 series lead. But in the moments after that game, Dantley's size 13 and a half sneakers disappeared and with them much of the excitement of a possible title because inside the shoes were specially made orthotics. It was, it was strange, you know, I mean, I, I panicked once I found out I didn't have my orthotics, I, I was like going crazy. Someone came in my locker room last night and stole my tennis shoes and my orthotics are in my tennis shoes. I think we put out a report national on Detroit TV and everything telling anyone who, uh, who had got my shoes that I need those orthotics. But would you please mail my orthotics to the airport Marriott in LA? And I used to have back problems, real serious back problems when I was in Utah. So uh, couldn't figure out, you know, why my back was hurting so much. I was going to a chiropractor on a regular basis and he would adjust me and I was play a game and my back was still hurt. He said, I think I know what the problem is. You know, you, you got, one of your legs just about be about a little bit shorter than the other one. So therefore, I, the orthotics, when I got them, I have no problem since with my back. These days, Dantley lives with his family in Silver Spring, Maryland, okay. close to where he grew up. He keeps busy as a crossing guard for the local school and even officiates some youth basketball games. And he still needs those orthotics for all of it. If you had to try and play without him in like that game six, that oh, I would have a bad game. I wouldn't have played. I wouldn't have been able to play. I would have played, but I wouldn't have been able to play well. At 6 5, number 45, Adrian Dantley. Well, I've always been a Pistons fan since I was a kid. Um, the days of, you know, Dave Bing and Bob Lanier, George Trapp went down and watched those guys play with my father, uh, Coba Hall. Steve Kraft of Clarkston remembers when you could get a free Pistons ticket with a tank of gas. But by 1988, free tickets were long gone. And for the playoffs, forget it. Leading up to that series, it was, everybody was so excited because, you know, we had to battle through the Celtics and beat the Celtics. And we had to, you know, get through the Lakers. And this was our time to get through the Lakers. We just knew we were going to win that series. By the 88 finals, Kraft had season tickets long enough that he and his friends were on a first name basis with the Silverdome staff and could pretty much go anywhere. So we would stand by this rope and the Pistons would come by and we'd always would high five them and shake their hand, tell them good game. And 
uh, that's where we went right after the game. We went and stood by the, this rope, and as they went by, we slapped them a high five. The Detroit Pistons are 51 seconds away from taking a 3-2 series lead back to Los Angeles. So tell me what happens that game. Pistons will finish their home season with this game in a flourish. Biggest playoff crowd of all time. The most successful year in the franchise's 31-year history. You know, in game five, it was just electric. He says the Lakers now, with 19 seconds to go, will clear their bench. They will go into the dressing room to avoid a possible mob scene. So after that game was over, and we were sit, standing there, and all of a sudden all this media encircled us, because I'd never, we'd, I've been standing there for three years after a game, and now all of a sudden you're around 100, 200 people that are the media, because this is a big deal, and you're going, wow, we're just engulfed by all these media people. And then they said, uh, they rolled up this, that big door and said, hey, the media can come in. So I looked at my buddies and I said, Guess we're going in the locker room. So we just followed the media in, and all of a sudden, boom, we were in the locker room with the Pistons getting interviewed after their big Game 5 win. What was that like? That was bizarre <laughs> is what it was like. It was uh, surreal. Um, I looked over and saw a stool sitting there next to Isaiah Thomas, so I went over there and sat on a stool, and a reporter was interviewing Isaiah Thomas. I'm sitting right next to him on the way out. We went by a locker that didn't have a door on the front. It was just a wide open locker, and there had to be 30 pair of shoes in there. So I thought, well, I might as well note the occasion with a pair of shoes. So I just reached in and grabbed a pair of shoes and kept walking like I owned them and just walked right out. And people said, see you later. It took about 24 hours before he realized what he grabbed wasn't just a harmless souvenir. And the team was pleading for the return of the shoes. No questions asked. So I called information and got a phone number for a Marriott out in L.A., called the phone number, car called the Marriott, and I said, can I have Adrian Dantley's room? They said, yep, sure, no problem. So then uh, Rick Mahorn answered the phone, and I said, is Adrian there? He said, no, he's not. And I said, well, I have his shoes. And he says, hang on a minute. <laughs> and Adrian Dantley picked up the phone and said, this is Adrian. I said, Mr. Dantley, I said, I did something really stupid last night. I snuck into the locker room and took a pair of shoes, and I have your orthotics. I, I kind of remember vaguely. I remember he saying he had my orthotics, and I was just happy. I, I, I was just happy that he had them, that he didn't throw them away. He said, uh, you know, keep the shoes. I just want the orthotic. I said, oh, no, no, no. I'm not keeping any of this stuff. I'll send it all back to you. And he was very insistent. He said, you know, you need to have uh, those shoes. Keep them. I just want the orthotics. I just said, hey, man, I'm glad you kept them. And, uh... Somehow it got to me, and then I was okay. Once I had them in my hands, I felt great. Yeah, I think he express mailed them yes. from the airport or whatever right out to there, and you guys were able to get them before the game. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Unbelievable. So at this point, the orthotic is on a plane headed for L.A. Dantley seems relieved, and Kraft feels like he's righted his wrong and is in the clear. Well, not quite. The news comes out at 11 o'clock. And it was the lead story on channels two, four, and seven here in the area. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what did I do? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everybody was talking about it. One of the reporters had uh, Adrian Dantley poolside talking about it. And he said, yeah, I talked to the guy tonight. And I'm going to get him back in the morning, so everything will be good. <laughs> I'm like, oh no. I mean, were you waiting for police to come knocking at your door? I was waiting for someone to knock at the door for sure. <laughs> and the next morning I wake up and I go get the, back when they did, delivered the newspaper to your driveway, pull the newspaper up off the driveway and look at it. And it says, have you seen this shoe? <laughs> if so, call the Pistons. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. It's a front page of the news. Back inside the forum where Detroit is up by six here. I'm Pat O'Brien. Good afternoon, everybody. This is a little story of why Adrian Dantley likes the mailman, and I'm not talking about Carl Malone. And just in case anyone in America missed the story in their local paper, this moment early in game six. Let's cut to game five now. After the game and the excitement of the game, the shoe was stolen. They put out an APB on the shoe because this is the only shoe he can wear. Newspapers, radios, policemen, the Hawaii 5 -0, everybody was looking for the shoe this morning. At 6 o'clock, the guy who stole the shoe called him and said, I've got the shoe. Yesterday morning at 6 o'clock, he sent the shoe to him and arrived late last night. Adrian says, keep the shoe, send the orthotics, but i got to tell you, 
The guy put his return address <laughs> on the package. I don't think you'll get a thank you note. Let's go back to Dick. I know what you're thinking. Why, when he's trying to just disappear at this point, would Kraft put a return address on the package? They said, you got to fill out this bill of lading. you got to put your name and your address on here. I'm going, oh, no, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> and the lady said, well, we're not going to ship your package. She didn't know what was in there. And I said, okay, so I made up a, a name, and then I put down the address, 1313 Mockingbird Lane. I was watching the game, and he said that. I'm like, you don't even get the joke. It was Herman Munster's address. I mean, come on, you got to pick up on that. You think somebody like Pat O'Brien would have picked up on it, but he didn't. Uh, so I thought that was kind of funny. And so this was kind of like the family secret for a long time. Oh, yeah. There was, I'd say, probably 10 people knew of the story for a decade. And for the 24 years or so after that, these size 13 and a half New Balance sneakers have sat on display in Kraft's basement. The only people who heard the story were those who saw the shoes and asked about them. Kraft once tried to clear the air with Dantley when A.D. visited the Palace as an assistant coach with the Nuggets, but he never made contact. Would you like another chance to try and meet him? Yeah, I'd like to meet him and tell him, hey, I'm sorry. You know, same thing I put in the note, meant no harm, uh, and apologized that I caused him any grief. Well, maybe we can arrange that. That would be pretty wild. <laughs> I'll be anxious to see what he says when he when he beats you. Right. Says, wow. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say if I told you he would like to apologize? He's actually here with us and wants to come say hi and apologize for that all these years later. Oh, I would be shocked. He's out in the car. Oh, really? Yeah. This is Steve Kraft, Adrian Dantley. Mr. Dantley. I can't believe that they kept you out in the car in the cold. <laughs> it's taken me uh, 35 years to come and Unbelievable. Be, uh, apologize that I... Apologize for what? I'm glad you didn't throw them away, as, as I've been telling the guys. <laughs> Again, All right. my apologies, sir. <laughs> I told him this is the yeah. this is the same authority. Is that that's it right Over there? Over thirty five years. Yeah. No I've been, kidding. I've been wearing the, the same ones. These are these are the ones I've been wearing them since twenty six years old. You said keep the shoes, and I said, oh no no sir, I don't want any any of this stuff because <laughs> I was thinking I'm in big trouble, right? Uh, no no. <laughs> and no. I said I don't want any of this, and you said no no, I want you to keep the shoes. You were adamant that I had kept those shoes. Yeah, I wasn't gonna wear them anymore. <laughs> Would you like to see them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, they're probably uh, New Balance, right? New Balance. Yeah. Yep. So they've been on display at my house for about 25 years. Yeah. Unlike uh, your 15-year career, I had a 15-minute career. <laughs> and so there's your shoes. Unbelievable. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Yeah, I remember these Detroit colors, the red, yeah. So when I woke up the next morning, uh, got the newspaper out of the driveway, there's what it said in that upper right corner, have right. you seen these shoes? <laughs> yeah. And I figured the police were going to come knocking at my door at any it. minute. I don't remember, was this in the Detroit Free Press? Was yes, this? sir. Yeah, I don't remember this. Yeah. I had uh, friends of mine uh, from about 10 cities in the country send me Newspaper articles of, about this. <laughs> sneak thief gets AD sneak. <laughs> <laughs> so you was a young guy when you got those shoes. Yes, I was. <laughs> I was a young guy. <laughs> Pretty uh, crazy time in my life, that was for sure. The story's a legend in my family. That's Is that right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I'm glad that, that you, I, I, when Jay Sampson did this, I said, provided he doesn't want to punch me in the face. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if I had kept on playing without him, yeah, you know, but no, no, no. Right. All this time, I mean, it's over like, over 30 years, over 30 years, 30, yeah. Yeah, 35 years. Unbelievable. <laughs> What do you want, Steve or Crafty? You I'll can put, put Steve. Crafty on there. Crafty? Yeah, C-R-A-F-T-Y. There you go. Thank you, sir. 
No I, problem. I appreciate that much. <laughs> Again, no harm, no foul. I'm glad you're a good sport with it.